Mr. Chancellor, it's my great pleasure to present to you the Right Honorable Paul Martin, Canada's 21st Prime Minister. Before becoming Prime Minister, Mr. Martin worked for the Canadian government and was appointed as the Minister for Finance. During his appointment, he successfully eliminated Canada's fiscal deficit and led the turnaround of the Canadian pension plan. He created the Canada Foundation for Innovation, which has been instrumental for science in Canada, investing millions of dollars in Canadian universities every year. While Prime Minister, Mr. Martin set in place a 10-year plan to improve health care, promoted early learning and childcare, created a new financial deal for municipalities and redefined marriage to include same-sex couples. Under his leadership, the Canadian government reached a historical consensus with Canada's provinces, territories, First Nations, Marys Nations, and Inuit leaders that would eliminate the gaps between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians in the areas of health, education, housing, and economic opportunity, an agreement known as the Kelowna Accord. Mr. Martin was the co-founder of the G20 as finance minister and upon stepping down from government, he also advised the African Development Bank, working closely with the advisory council of the Coalition for Dialogue on Africa. He was founding co-chair of the Congo Basin Forest Fund. All these initiatives are of course uh, extremely important for Canada and the world and selecting any of these individual projects that Mr. Martin established and led in order to highlight his commitments to social justice is a challenge. I will, however, mention one of these initiatives uh, that aligns very closely with the mission of the fact of education and with McGill University, the establishment of the Martin Family Initiative. The Martin Family Initiative is a charitable organization focused on providing support for the education, health, and well-being of indigenous youth and their communities. It has had a tremendous positive impact in our indigenous people and he continues to advance several programs that are directly linked to the development of indigenous youth and their lives. Along these lines, Mr. Martin established the Capital for Indigenous and, and, and Prosperity and Entrepreneurship, which invests in Aboriginal business across the country. Mr. Martin's lifelong commitment to public service in Canada and around the world has been and continues to be extraordinary, and his contributions to indigenous education are exemplary and second to none. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you the Right Honorable Paul Martin, who may you confer upon him the degree of Doctor of Law, Honoris Causa. It's now my great pleasure to invite the Right Honourable Paul Martin to come to the podium and deliver the Convocation Address. Dr. Martin. Oh, good, thank you. Thank you very much. Chancellor Meehan, Principal and Vice-Chancellor Poitier, Chair of the Board Cobbett, Dean Rassier, proud parents and guests. Thank you all for the honor that McGill has just bestowed upon me. I've got to tell you that this honor, I've just learned, is somewhat contested. I got a phone call this morning. My, my three grandsons are sitting in the front, and I got a phone call from one of them this morning asking a question I could not answer, which was, Papa, how can you be graduating if you didn't go to school? So, <laughs> if you can figure the answer to that, to let me know. I also want to thank my old friend Laddie Pathy for partake partaking in the ceremony and for doing the hooding. Although, to be truthful, I think you could you darn near scramble me. You could use a couple of lessons. <laughs> and with that, I begin. First, allow me to acknowledge that we gather together, and as we do so, we do so on the traditional territory, as we have seen, of the Mohawk people. 
Then allow me to recognize the reason we meet, and that is to congratulate you, the graduates who have worked so hard to get here. This is your day, and I am very grateful that you are allowing me to share it with you. The fact is, when I received the invitation to say a few words to a McGill convocation, I asked, and I spoke to Dean Rassier, to, to, uh, to Vice Chancellor Fortier, I wondered if I could speak to you, those of you who are graduating on this particular convocation day. I did so because there is no vocation in my mind that is more important than the one that lies before you, you who will be Canada's educators of tomorrow. Tout simplement, je ne peux pas imaginer une vocation plus importante que celle qui attend les éducateurs de demain. Well, my time in formal education ended, as I was forced to tell my grandson some 50 years ago. I returned to the field in the last decade, this time to focus on the education of the fastest growing segment of our population, Indigenous youth. And if you'll allow me in the bit of time at my disposal, I would like to dwell on the issues that this speaks to, not because I believe that any of you will teach only Indigenous students, but because no matter where it is you are in Canada, the probability is that you will have one or more Indigenous students in your classes or in your lecture halls. And my hope is that you will be able to take the time in each case to understand the voyage those students will have taken to get there and the pressures that they are under. In this context, McGill is to be congratulated for everything that is done. I've just had lunch with the Dean, and it is incredible what McGill has done in terms of leading so many universities and so much of the country in this area. And I really give you simply one example of the strong Indigenous perspective that is part of its curriculum. This can be seen in the introduction this year of the university's First Nations and Inuit Bachelor of Kindergarten and Elementary Education degree. And let me tell you, I think you should congratulate them. I think it's a tremendous, tremendous thing. Indeed, as McGill has demonstrated with considerable foresight, the quality and understanding of post-secondary education is improving markedly for Indigenous students in Canada. Unfortunately, however, this is at the university level. And the same thing cannot be said for that which precedes higher education, that is to say our elementary and secondary schools on and off reserve and in the far north. And the reasons for this can be found in the discriminatory and counterproductive underfunding of Indigenous education in this country down through the ages. And to those who would still argue that we can't afford to do more, let me tell you the numbers are unequivocal. The cost of teaching Indigenous students to read and write, to add and subtract, to speak their own languages, to learn their own culture, and to grow up confident in their own identity is nothing compared to the social and economic cost of illiteracy, of pandemic suicide, of drug abuse, and of incarceration. And this And this is why you, the graduates here today, are so important. We're talking about kids. We're talking about kids who need allies. We're talking about people who will understand when children are taken away into care, away from their schools and away from their communities. We want people who understand, as you do, what happens when First Nations schools have no science labs, no math tutors, no, so no programs for kids with special needs, schools where there are no libraries, no extracurricular activity, and no college or university streams. Soyons clairs. Aucune société ne peut résoudre ses problèmes sociaux et économiques sans un système d'éducation de première classe qui reflète sa culture. Virtually every indigenous leader I have ever met has identified education as the key to the social and economic problems facing their people. 
And this is why I believe, because of this career choice that you have all made, that you hold the future of Canada in your hands. For you have the opportunity to develop and to mold the young minds of tomorrow. But this must be all of the young minds of tomorrow, without exception. As a country, we have a future to deliver. Promises inscribed on the parchment of treaties and in the words of the Constitution but also etched in the hearts of so many young Indigenous Canadians who ask not only for the opportunity to succeed, but also to be understood. And this too must be part of your role, graduates, for the depth and breadth of Indigenous culture is too rich to be ignored. Indeed, whether it is acknowledged by the majority or not, the underpinnings of our society, of Canadian society, are not derived solely from European origins. The fact is that Canada's foundations are built upon pillars that existed long before most of us or our ancestors got here. And to deny the consequences of that coming together is not only to deny our own origins, but it as well is to subvert the very questions that have advanced human knowledge this far. If it is, as I believe it is, knowledge for knowledge's sake that has led to humanity's greatest triumphs, then the question becomes quite straightforward. How can we move ahead if Canadian scholars are confined to a conditional wisdom bound by Western limits and sustained by the least curious among us? And the answer is, we can't. So what must we do? Well, the answer, I believe, can be found in an insight in McGill's Professor Emeritus Charles Taylor, who stated that it is non-recognition, the fact of Indigenous students not being there in the minds of the majority, of being invisible, that is a major moral dilemma that we face as a country. And he's right, because no student should ever have to leave their culture and identity at the door when they walk into a classroom in this country. And therein lies the importance of the profession that you have chosen. For it is you, it is you, the graduates who are here today, will spearhead the effort to meet the demands of tomorrow by nurturing young minds, by helping them grow, and by giving them the tools and the recognition that they need to succeed. And on that, because I go on too long, although you can't take this away from me now, can you? Anyway. But let me close these remarks by saying to the graduates how proud all of us on this stage and all of those who are behind you are of you. The challenge before you is great, but the choice you have made speaks so well of you and those who have supported you through the process. What I've raised here today has been embedded in everything you have been taught at McGill. And now the opportunity to put it all to work is before you and nothing could be more exciting. You are the graduates of a great university and you can make the difference, and I know you will. There isn't one person here in this tent who doesn't envy you for what you're about to do, including me. So good luck, bonne chance, and thank you.